Friends, it's wonderful to be here with you again in First Methodist Church, to be here with Reverend Wendy and with all the many friends we have. I bring you greetings from Duke Divinity School and uh, we're, with thanksgiving for the, quite a number of our students who are here as members of the Texas Conference, and we are excited to be sharing in the work of ministry with you. I will admit that when I accepted the invitation to come here, I actually didn't know that this was going to be Memorial Day weekend came as a bit of a surprise, but there are a number of surprises, including the fact that the Houston Rockets are in the NBA Conference Finals, <clears throat> not too happily at this point, I guess, and that the Houston Astros are in first place in their division. Uh, this is, shows that you never know what miracles to expect. <clears throat> but in any case, I'm delighted to be with you. Would you join me in a word of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And so we too are all assembled together here in this place, not in Jerusalem, but in downtown Houston on this day of Pentecost. And indeed, this morning, we have had a rush of mighty wind and claps of thunder and an outpouring from above. We're here to remember and to celebrate the outpouring of not of a rainstorm, but of God's Spirit on the church and to reflect together on what the coming of the Spirit might mean for us. I recently came across a brand new Pentecost hymn written by a professor of music at Baylor University. His name, and I promise you I'm not making this up, is Don Music. This hymn elegantly evokes the excitement of Luke's account of the day of the early church, the, the day that the early church in Jerusalem first received the Spirit. So I'm going to read you the lyrics of this new hymn. A rushing, mighty, wind roars through a crowded room, and tongues of fire upon their heads disperse the people's gloom. God's Spirit blows the wind and lights the blood-red flame. A Pentecost of tongues explodes in praise of Jesus' name. Three thousand souls that day in mind and heart were stirred, and these were added to the church as they believed the word. Lord, make our breath a wind, and let our tongues be fire. And as at that first Pentecost, your people's lives inspire. Now that hymn is a celebration of the joy and the power of the coming of the Spirit. The disciples gathered in Jerusalem, previously cautious and fearful, are now swept up in the wind rush of the Holy Spirit, and empowered by fire, they begin proclaiming the word boldly in many languages all at once. It's a vivid preview of the history that is to follow. These early followers of Jesus, who were once upon a time a pitiful little handful of Galilean peasants, are now starting to proclaim a word that spreads like wildfire through the whole world, beginning with the conversion and baptism, it says, of 3,000 people on that one astonishing day. And so each year we recall the day of Pentecost with glad hymns, perhaps the waving of banners, and with effusive praise, <clears throat> and rightly so. But what does it actually mean that the Spirit has been poured out upon us? What follows for us from this awe-inspiring event? This whooshing, fiery drama is not a Hollywood special effects scene that simply seeks to dazzle us with amazing spectacles while we sit back as spectators and eat popcorn. No, this is an event that changes the world we live in, and it changes us. 
changes our role. So this morning, I want to suggest to you three things that have changed, <coughs> three things that are different because the Spirit has been poured out. First, the wind of the Spirit is a hurricane that has broken down our dividing walls. The story makes it clear that the startled onlookers, it says, were from every nation under heaven, and they all spoke different languages. They, they came from as many different lands and cultures as are represented in the vast cosmopolitan diversity of the city of Houston. <coughs> the city of Houston, which has become one of the most ethnically complex cities in our land. Yet miraculously, they were all able to hear the disciples' spirit speech in their own native tongues, no matter how diverse. The great 19th century novelist Nathaniel Hawthorne describes the scene like this. Each person in the assembled crowd heard the word in the heart's native language. The heart's native language. The effect of the Spirit's arrival is to meld all these different strangers into a brand new community, a community of followers of Jesus in which these ethnic and cultural and linguistic differences cease to matter, a community where they join together in a way that would have been impossible before. I recently spent a week in Nagasaki, Japan. It was a remarkable conference on Christian reconciliation in Northeast Asia. There were Christians there not only from Japan and the United States, but also from mainland China, from Taiwan, Hong Kong, Thailand, South Korea, and even North Korea. The conversations there were volatile and challenging because these are people who have historically been at war with one another. They've been at odds. There are terrible atrocities that have been committed by some of these nations against others. And indeed, one of the sessions was actually held in the Museum of the Atomic Bomb in Nagasaki, where I had the challenging task of giving a lecture about the Christian vision of reconciliation. But the thing that was amazing about this conference with these different Christians from these different nations is that the Holy Spirit was there. The Holy Spirit was there enabling reconciliation and setting loose tears and breaking down cultural barriers. One of the most audible signs of that reconciliation came when we worshiped together and we came to saying the Lord's Prayer. As we prayed together, each one, each person there prayed in his or her own language. It created a cacophony of sound. But each of us heard and knew what was being said to the one God, our Father, in the heart's native language. It was a Pentecost. So first, the Spirit breaks down our divisions and creates this new community. Second, the outpouring of the Spirit was not merely a blessing for the insiders to this new community. Rather, the Spirit came in order to launch and empower a mission. Peter explains it to the crowd by quoting from the prophet Joel, in the last days it will be that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh all flesh. This dramatic event of Pentecost, you see, is not only the, it's not only a blessing for this little group in Jerusalem, but it's, it's the beginning of a big bang, an explosion that propels these disciples outward through the whole Mediterranean world to spread the good news about Jesus. And this outward moving mission is not only a job for a small circle of chosen apostles who are eventually going to get their pictures immortalized in stained glass windows in churches around the world. It's not just for this special group. It's not only for some group who are ordained clergy or something like that. Listen again to the prophecy. 
I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And prophesying, of course, doesn't mean making predictions about the future. One of my favorite sayings, one of my favorite philosophers is Yogi Berra, who famously said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> but they're not making predictions. They're speaking forth the word of God, telling people what God has to say to our time. So the Spirit is now poured out on the whole community, and the whole community is empowered to participate in proclaiming and embodying the Word. There are 120 of these believers present all together, and they are all filled with the Spirit, and they all begin to proclaim boldly. So the Spirit is poured out on all flesh, and that includes us. It includes us here today. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female. It doesn't matter whether you're from a powerful, wealthy family or whether you're a descendant of slaves. It doesn't matter what your skin color might be. It doesn't matter whether some church body has ordained you or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Can I say that here in Texas? It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't matter because God's Spirit is poured out on all who call on the name of the Lord. Peter puts it like this at the very end of his speech to the crowd. The promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. That promised spirit that flooded on the church at Pentecost is exactly the same spirit that Jesus spoke about at the very beginning of his public activity when he stood up in the synagogue in Nazareth and declared, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. <clears throat> that's the spirit, that same spirit that's now poured out on us, the spirit that will move us to empower and continue to do what Jesus did and taught. And the prayer walk that Reverend Wendy referred to in his announcements a little while ago is an example of that, of the way in which the spirit could be at work in this community to reach out to the city surrounding you and to pray for and to offer the boundless grace of God through the Holy Spirit to this world in which we find ourselves. But I began by saying three things are different because the Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. First, the Spirit breaks down our divisions. Second, the Spirit propels us outward into mission. These are images of transformation and power. But the third thing I want to say about the Holy Spirit is of a little different sort, and we don't find it in the account in Acts 2 of Pentecost, but we find it in the reading of Paul's letter to Rome. The Spirit doesn't only fill us with power and hope, but the Spirit also causes us to grieve and to groan and to suffer, along with the fallen and suffering creation. And that's closely tied to mission. This is something we don't often think about on the day of Pentecost, but it seems to me it follows very closely from the fact that this spirit is poured out by Jesus, who came into the world anointed with the spirit and power, but who also entered into this world's suffering and took upon himself the groaning and suffering of an unredeemed world. God has poured out the spirit on all flesh, 
And that means that God has not immediately changed us into disembodied spirits. God has not immediately beamed us up into heaven. But instead, God in the form of the Spirit has descended upon our flawed and fragile flesh. Throughout the New Testament, this word flesh is used to describe the state of mortal human existence. It highlights the truth that we are limited, finite creatures who suffer and who will die. And to say that we are flesh connotes the state even of our current alienation from the fullness that God desires to give us. So what does it mean to say that the Spirit is poured out on all flesh? Now this passage in Paul's letter, Romans 8, contains Paul's profoundest meditation on this mystery. He speaks of the whole creation as being suspended in a state of eager longing, longing for a fulfillment that we do not yet see. He says the whole creation is like a woman in labor, a woman in labor writhing in pain and groaning and aching for a birth that hasn't quite yet come to pass. And then he writes one of the most remarkable, mind-blowing sentences in the whole New Testament. He writes, it's not only the creation that's groaning, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now please notice he doesn't say redemption from our bodies. He says the redemption of our bodies. He's talking about the hope of the resurrection of the body the restoration of the suffering creation on the day when the whole creation, as he says, will be set free from its bondage to decay, the day when death will die and we will enter into the fullness of life. But in the present time, in history as we know it, we don't yet see that, Paul says. We don't see what we hope for. And it, in that situation, it's precisely the presence of the Spirit of God in our hearts that causes us to feel all the more intensely how great the gap is between our present fleshly suffering and the joy that we know is coming. The Spirit actually intensifies our painful sense of solidarity with all those who suffer in the present age. So how does that work? When we read of refugees in rickety boats seeking freedom but exposed to hunger and in danger of drowning, we groan. When we read of innocent civilians beheaded or slaughtered by violent forces in the Middle East, we groan. When we think of friends and family who have served as soldiers and who have been killed or wounded in war, we groan. When we hear that our country has the highest per capita rate of imprisonment of its citizens of any developed country in the world, we groan. When we encounter homeless people on the streets, we groan. When drug addiction or alcoholism strikes close to home, we groan. When we confront the diagnosis of cancer, we groan when we face the death of loved ones or even our own impending death, we groan. I guess I'm tempted to add when we watched the Houston Rockets play last night, we groan. But I'm serious. It's the spirit that makes us groan, maybe not about the Rockets, but about all the other things that I listed. Even with inarticulate noises, we groan because we don't know what to do about any of these things. And our finitude, in our finitude, in our frailty, we can't even find the words to express our sorrow and our suffering. I expect that 
women among us today who have given birth to children could testify to the sort of groaning that Paul speaks about. Indeed, anyone who has experienced sharp pain knows what it is to cry out. That, says Paul, is what our prayer is like. It's the work of the Spirit in us that's crying to God and interceding for us when we feel a desperate, holy longing for everything that is wrong to be made right. But precisely because it is God's Spirit groaning in and through us, this amazing passage ends on a note of hope when Paul writes, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how to pray, but the very Spirit intercedes for us it's the Spirit of God, and that Spirit sustains in us hope for what we do not see. The Spirit kindles, in T.S. Eliot's phrase, Pentecostal fire in the dark time of the year. Pentecostal fire in the dark time of the year. And it's that Pentecostal fire that points to the glory that is to be revealed in the resurrection. So this is my prayer for you, for the church, for all of us in the midst of what Paul calls the sufferings of this present time. I pray that Jesus Christ, who is raised from the dead and now at the right hand of God, will pour out on each of you and on us all the power of the Holy Spirit. So that the same Spirit the same Spirit that descended on the first disciples at Pentecost in tongues of flame might break down our division, that the Holy Spirit would launch us together out into mission to the world, and that that Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit might help us in our weakness, might cause our finite flesh to live in hope for the freedom of the glory of the children of God. If God should grant that prayer, the impact on the church and on the world would be incalculable. We have, we have our work indeed cut out for us. But thanks be to God, the power necessary for that work does not come from us because the Spirit helps us in our weakness and fills us with hope. So in the power of the Spirit, let us go forth from this sanctuary today to go out with the Spirit poured on our flesh and prophesy. I ask you to join me in praying the Lord's Prayer, and especially if English is not your first language, if it's not the language of your heart, pray in your own language as we pray together in the words our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.